West to Harmin Freon and welcome to another video. In today's video, I would like to prove to you and to Amazon once again that The Lord of the Rings and indeed the entire work of J.R.R. Tolkien is a purely English work of art and then mainly The Lord of the Rings was written as a sort of myth or a legend that was given by Tolkien to England because England doesn't have much of its own native stories, native legends, native myths left. After all, Beowulf is Scandinavian and King Arthur is uh, Welsh slash Norman French and so on and so forth. The same thing could be said about Robin Hood that comes mainly from uh, French poems, right? Norman French. And I am going to talk about two things, two aspects of The Lord of the Rings specifically that make it extraordinarily English. And that the creators of the Amazon upcoming uh, The Rings of Power should realize it and stick to the fact that Tolkien wrote it for England and based his works solely and chiefly and exclusively on the medieval and pre-medieval Europe. But let us focus on the subject at hand. We could, of course, mention the Hobbits, which, according to Tolkien himself, were a representation of uh, the <laughs> English village people living in the country, in, in the countryside where Tolkien lived, and they were living the homely life, a simple life, a very comfortable life, and... They didn't want to burden themselves with great and grave manners, and they just wanted to live their life peacefully, eat six times a day, and tend their gardens, tend to their to their fields, and raise their animals, and plant their plants. Just live an ordinary, simple village life. But what is more interesting for me is... Actually, the, the Rohirrim, the people of Rohan, uh, the peoples, a nation in Middle-earth that was based on the old English people, on Anglo-Saxons. And it is close to my heart because I myself studied hi uh, historical linguistics and literature, uh, mainly old English literature, the Anglo-Saxon poetry and prose at university and there you can see the inspiration for Tolkien's Rohirrim even more than the description of their halls and their clothes and their weapons. I'm talking about their poetry and their language. Of course, we could talk about the Golden Hall of Meduseld and its description and that it is basically the same as uh, many of the long halls and mead halls that um, were very common among the Anglo-Saxon nobility, uh, you know, the rich people, the aristocracy. And uh, of course, that was brought over from... Uh, Scandinavia and from the uh, area of today's Germany by the Anglo-Saxon tribes when they were invading Britain and chasing away the original Celtic population. So we could find long halls like that, like Medusel, the Golden Hall, both in Scandinavia with Vikings and in Anglo-Saxon England. But of course, what makes peoples, what makes a nation, well, is the language, isn't it? And it's the art, the stories, the poetry. And Tolkien, him, knowing Old English very well and being uh, very, very much skilled in not only understanding Old English and Old English poetry, but also in writing and mimicking the style of Old English poetry, he needed to use it, of course, in his works of art, in The Lord of the Rings, among other things. So, what better way to use the Old English poetry and the, uh, the style of Old English poetry than to put it into the mouths of the Rohirrim, the peoples who he based on Anglo-Saxons. But 
For this part of the video, I would like to use excerpts from uh, an article that I wrote a couple of years ago for, um, well, the university journal that I um, studied and taught at. And I want to talk about the Old English Mitra, or the alliterative verse, first. So I'm going to read out a couple of short excerpts with examples, and then I will demonstrate it on uh, one or two very, very short excerpts from Tolkien. The poetry I analyze in this article is oftentimes called alliterative, and that is because one of the two most prominent aspects of it was the use of alliteration, or head rhyme, which is when two or more words within a verse begin with the same sound. Indeed, the important word here is sound, for alliterative poetry was first disseminated orally. Thus, it is meant to be read aloud, and it is sounds that alliterate, not necessarily letters. The rules were that each consonant alliterated with itself, except the paired consonants sh, sp, and st, which could only alliterate with themselves, which means that, for instance, schild can alliterate with schirving, but not with stan, and any vowel could alliterate with any other vowel. An Old English verse was furthermore divided into two half-lines, or hemistics, or so-called A-verse and B-verse, and it was alliteration that connected the pair syntactic syntactically and to a certain extent semantically, for usually three important words in a full verse alliterated, occasionally four. Here, the word stress, the other important aspect of alliterative poetry, should be mentioned. The metrical rules of Old English poetry were based on varying positions of stressed and unstressed syllables in individual hemistics, rather than on a fixed pattern, as is the case with romance-based poems. Stressed syllables are called lifts and unstressed syllables are called dips, and it is the former that alliterates, mostly being important, strong words, just nouns, adjectives or verbs. Usually a half-line contained two main stresses, whereas the number of unstressed syllables could be relatively unlimited. And so on and so forth. Um, and then I've got an example of a poem, an Old English poem, that used all these rules. And in Old English it went Herr Ethelstan König, Georg Ladrichten, Beorna Beachi, Vandis Brother, Ea, Gerdmund, Edeling, Eldor Lagnetir, Yeslogon, Atseke, Sverda, Echum, Umbe, Brunanburg. And in uh, modern English, this is my translation, it goes Herr Ethelstan King, Earl's leader, bracelet giver, and his brother to Edmund Prince, on a one forever, slaying in battle with sword's edges around Brunanburg. So, as you can see, it's quite different from poetry that is being written nowadays. And this is another example that I wanted to use from uh, Beowulf, actually, the uh, Old English epic poem. Mere Theoden, Edeling Erhard, und blieve sad, Throde Thristwith, Thain Sorche Dreach. And there you can see not only all the rules, but also the word Theoden, which in Old English meant Lord, of the Lord of People, or, be, or really, you know, a king. So, King Theoden is really a gnomon omen, right? So there already, in a simple name, we can see the inspiration with the uh, Anglo-Saxon people. Theoden's name is basically an Old English word for a lord, a lord of people. Now we've got a poem from the two towers, uttered this time not by the Rohirrim, but by Treebeard. Learn now the lore of the living creatures, first name the four, the free peoples, eldest of all, the elf children, dwarf the delve, the dark are his houses, ent the earthborn, old as mountains, man the mortal, master of horses, and so on and so forth. So there you can see that Tolkien was indeed able to mimic the style, the, the metre of Old English poetry perfectly and um, incorporate it into modern English, actually, and put it into the mouth of Treebeard, of Hangorn, which was, of course, uh, you know, very near Rohan. But here I chose only a very short excerpt from The Lord of the Rings uh, when Theoden was, was uh, you know, having his war cry. And it is basically a short micro poem in itself, and it represents all the rules that I have read here aloud so far. Arise now, arise, rioters of Theoden, dire deeds awake, dark is it eastward, let horse be bridled, horn be sounded, 
fourth Erlingas. So there, as you can see, it is indeed, we could imagine uh, the poem or the lines being divided in the middle into two hemistics or two half lines, both of them containing two stressed syllables and a reasonably unlimited number of unstressed syllables. And then there, the stressed syllables are um, designated by the X symbol above uh, the individual syllables. And then um, the alliteration in question is in bold. So as you can see, arise, because the rise is under stress, so only stressed syllables could uh, alliterate. Arise, arise, riders of Theoden. Dire deeds awake, dark is it eastward. Let horse be bridled, horn be sounded, and so on and so forth. This is so purely, so clearly, so brutally Anglo-Saxon that it, there, is, there can be no question about the Rohirrim being purely English. And that is one of the million, billion, gazillion things that I love about the Lord of the Rings. You can feel not only the fictitious history, but a real history, the history of the world, an ancient history of Europe, of England and Britain, Scandinavia, the Germanic lands and so on and so forth. No wonder Tolkien was working on his Arda stories for his entire life, because they are the world by themselves. We can say that they are a mirror image of our real world, perfected in some ways, made darker in other ways, but it is a fact. And it is indeed a mirror image of the ancient Europe, medieval and pre-medieval. So there was just a little one snippet, a, a shattered image, a fragment of the awesome plethora of uh, inspiration that went into The Lord of the Rings and that proves that it is indeed a European work of art. So let me know in the comments down below what you think about all this and um, what is the next subject matter that you would like to hear about, because there are many things to talk about concerning Tolkien. So thank you very much for watching, that will be all, and Namariye.